thank you for coming this evening. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about dogs and if they can improve our physical and emotional well being. And here I have a picture of a favorite golden retriever of my family's. This golden retriever called Izzy lives in Canada. And this picture came along with a caption saying, Izzy really wants the children to go back to school. However, they think that she's a superhero. And um, it's her superpowers that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, as well as some, some other dogs. So this is the, the, the point that we're here to discuss tonight is it's a really well distributed finding that pets are good for us, especially dogs. There's all sorts of findings and issues that they're good for depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. And what I'd like to talk to you tonight is these findings and try to drill a little bit, maybe I, there's really complex mechanisms behind all of this. But what I'd like to do tonight is tell you about some of my research exploring the mechanisms underlying these conditions and the factors that may explain the behaviors that we see in why dogs make us happy. So I'm gonna give you a bit of neuroscience um, and uh, explore some of the neuroscientific mechanisms that may explain these behaviors. And then also look at just some more recent studies that look at why dogs might be good for us. There's also going to be lots of pictures of, of dogs. And this is our boy called Penny and, uh, and, and my son. And I have Penny here, I'm just gonna grab him. And we'll see if we can see if we can get uh, see if we can get Penny um, shown to uh, to you in uh, in in person. And Penny um, is a well-being dog for Newcastle University, and specifically for the for the for the School of Psychology. And um, he, during normal times, comes into the office with me once or twice a week, and is available for pets and cuddles, and just um, general um, general cuddles, aren't you? So this is Penny, and there's going to be lots of photos of uh, of of Penny um, of, uh, of of Penny tonight put him back over there. And so I'm going to tell you also embedded with some explanations of, of my research and some other research in this area, just my experience of having a well-being dog and um, the role that Penny has played for, um, for, for my family. So what I, to start, let's ask a really, really general question. And throughout my career, what I've explored in one way or another is the question of what is well-being? What is it that makes us feel better? And what we have on really extreme general ends is this relationship between our feelings and our mind, what's going on with what we feel and how that's expressed in the brain, what's happening in the, in, the, in the brain. So let's talk about this relationship between the mind and feelings and explore factors that may affect what makes us feel better. And if we look to the literature, we're told that things like stress, conflict in our lives, loneliness, a major factor, especially in the current climate, the amount of exercise that we get, um, dietary factors, the amount and the quality of sleep that we get, and also financial factors are the major players in terms of things that can affect us and can affect our, our general well-being. So how can dogs have a role in that? How can they, how can they help in that? What I want to do first is take a digression. I want to take a diversion. And the reason I want to take a diversion is because I want to explore with you some of the neural mechanisms that may explain how those factors that we just talked through affect us. And where I'd like to start is with the area of memory. 
And why I want to start with memory is because how we process and remember emotions and how we remember our sense of selves are very, very linked to our emotions. And what I have here on the screen are some pictures of brains and the big purple picture. If you look inside that, that's a, called a coronal section of a rat brain. And hopefully you can see a wing-like structure in darker purple. And that's a really interesting brain structure if we're thinking about memory. That's the hippocampus. And that brain structure is really important for a specific kind of memory, episodic memory. And episodic memory is how we remember the events in our past. So everything from what you ate for lunch today from what toy, what favorite toy you got for your seventh birthday. Those are all episodic memories that make up um, our sense of who we are and our sense of personal history. The brain structures that support this kind of memory have been found to be really, really important in issues of well-being. This brain structure is found within the medial temporal lobe, which is an area of the, a very large area of the brain, and linked directly to the limbic system. And the limbic system is responsible for processing our emotions. Importantly, especially for this talk, because we're talking about animals, the hippocampus is found in other animals, other species, other than humans. And there's some pictures of what it looks like in different species of animals. So let's talk about chickens for a minute. I said I was going to take a diversion and I really meant a diversion. And the reason that I want to talk about chickens is because we can ask the question, what's happening in the brain when things happen to it that impact well-being? So let's say, for example, stress chronic stress, what does that do to the brain? Does it change the brain? Does it impact the brain? And what we know from humans is that this area of the brain, the hippocampus, suffers atrophy and decreased volume for individuals that suffer prolonged and recurrent episodes of depression and chronic stress. We know in rats that the hippocampus is affected in something called neurogenesis, which is the process of new cells being born. You see decreased neurogenesis um, after rats are exposed to chronic stress. So the question is then, will these alterations be seen in chickens that are put under stress? And in this case, it was a dietary restriction that created um, the stress in the, um, in, in the chickens. And the question was, would we see these markers of stress and depression, a negative subjective state, in these chickens. And what we were looking for is this purple picture here. Hopefully you can see a purple picture with a black neuron sitting on top of it. And if you've studied anything about the brain, hopefully you can see that there's a cell body there and then there's some nice dendrites coming off of it and an axon connecting down to dendritic branching at the, at the bottom of the of the of the neuron and that's what we were looking for the number of neurons in the brain and did dietary stress reduce the number of those newly born neurons and indeed we've got a picture of the chicken hippocampus here and some different types of cells we were looking for and we did find this we found that the number of newly born cells in the hippocampus was a marker for chronic stress in a negative direction. Fewer newly born cells were found in chickens who had undergone chronic stress. So repeated continuous stress. So stress is not good for us. Another way that I've explored this question is a question about emotions. So how do we remember emotions? How do emotions impact us? And the way that I explored this was giving, um, giving participants pictures and these pictures carried a different emotional valence. So some were positive, some were neutral, and because they're sensitive, I haven't given examples of negative um, images, but these were taken from the um, Geneva Effective um, Picture Database. And they were taken from there. And what we did is the, my, my students in my research group gave participants 
these images, had, had them place them in different locations, and then simply asked them which ones they remembered. And what we were trying to explore is, do we remember positive experiences better, or do we remember negative experiences better? And what we found when the, the number of images that the participants remembered, what we found is that participants remembered the negative images more, significantly more than the positive or the neutral images. Now, if we look to evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology, there's very good reasons why we remember negative things more than we remember, um, more than we remember positive things. But it's interesting that if we need to, for an evolutionary advantage to stay alive, remember negative information, what does that do to us if things like chronic stress is bad? So this leads us to some interesting research questions. How do we remember emotions? How are emotional memories represented in the brain? What are emotions? And importantly, how are emotions linked to well-being? So the first time that this question for me was put in the perspective of dogs was quite a few years ago now. This is an article from 2012 from the CBC, and it caught my eye for a few reasons because I was very very much missing my homeland of Canada at the time. And I saw that Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia had opened a puppy room. And the puppy room was open during exams for students to come in and play with dogs and stroke dogs and walk dogs just to reduce stress. And the students couldn't contain their joy because they were so happy. And this is the first time that I encountered the idea that I'd always had dogs myself and I knew that they made me happy, but it's the first time I thought from a research perspective, this could be really good for people. This um, has this has moved on. This idea has moved on now to um, to um, a different sort of extreme, where um, the idea of animals providing us with emotional support is so accepted that there are turkeys and squirrels and unfortunately my picture of a peacock hasn't turned up i'm not quite sure why but there should be a picture of an emotional support peacock that was getting ready for a flight um, are taken onto onto planes as a way of saying that a person requires that emotional support in order to be able to perform certain activities and um and and behaviors so this is an extreme end from the idea being quite novel that giving people puppies to play with in 2012, moving forward to 2019, where Turkey is being given a seat on a plane to provide emotional support. So that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty big shift in a short period of time and makes a strong case that animals, um, animals are linked to our emotions and our experience in quite a profound way. This is another example that I found very commonly in the news and in um, and about the internet when I was researching this this question. Um, in terms of um, consolidating emotions and connection, there was a lot of stories that I found such as this, where a pet or an animal is being brought to connect with a person who's dying for the final time. So we're seeing a relationship with animals that spans the developmental lifetime and has an, a, a profound effect on people's um, sense of self and, um, and, and well-being. So what about dogs? I mean, that's what we're here to, you know, to, to talk about, right? So this is, uh, this is Penny again. And as I mentioned really, really briefly before, dogs have been associated with all kinds of physical and mental benefits. So there's all sorts of studies, for example, one in Sweden showed that there's a lower risk of cardiovascular disease and even mortality in people who have dogs. And that pet ownership was associated with lower hypertension. 
Now, there's a few thoughts around that, and we're going to go a bit more into this, into the research underlying this to understand it a little bit better, and hopefully, um, you know, come to some conclusions about why dogs might be might be good for us. And if if is the answer just to get everyone a dog, you know, I probably not, but we'll come to that. We'll come to a conclusion at the um, at the at the end of this. So. Dogs are brilliant in so many ways, and there's ways that we are familiar with the ways that dogs are good in, in helping us. This is a, a UK company that I found that is training dogs to do various different things, to be able to sniff out cancer, to be able to smell out neurological diseases, to be able to smell different bacteria. So if you think about food safety or um, um, different sorts of exposures to people with different sorts of diseases. If, if it can be determined if a particular bacteria is present in the environment, dogs can be helpful there. And even with, um, with malaria, dogs and the relationship with humans have they found to be helpful in many ways. And I wanted to give you an example um, of 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 that coming on coming on to that um but first let's take a look at the power of a dog's nose so they're not just about um the noses and what they can um provide for us but dogs are amazing creatures um that are able to detect things in us sense um, what's happening in us on a profound level that we can't understand. And this, this picture here, I thought really gives a good idea of what's happening in a, in a dog's nose and maybe um, give us a clue as to why they have these amazing abilities to sometimes know us better than we know ourselves. So I have a video to show you. Would you like me to try playing it, Barbara Ann? Yes, if you'd like to, Laura. It's, it's, oh, I've got it. Perfect. Let me, let me try once here, and if it doesn't work, I'll give it over to you, Laura. Perfect. People with type 1 diabetes have to manage their condition with, uh, with insulin. To, to do this, they have to measure blood. Barbara Ann, we can't see the video. We can hear it, but we can't see it. OK, I'm going to give it to you to, um, to manage, Perfect. Laura. Lovely. No, but I can't hear anything. I'm not sure if other people can. Thank you, Felicity. Um, I'm just trying to suss out why that's not working. I'm going to try. Can you hear anything now? No. We can abandon Barbara, it if it doesn't work. What I'll do, Barbara Ann, is I'll in the um I'll pop in the Q and A section. I'll pop a link so people can watch the video afterwards if that's okay. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Great, so um, if I could get my screen back, Laura, do I do that? Mm 
to be able to take over now, Barbara. Right. I've got it now. Apologies for that uh, for that delay, but I'll um, descriptively describe the uh, the uh, the video to you. And it's a woman who's um, who has who has diabetes. And um, if you watch it back later, it's quite amazing actually because she talks about the number of times that the dog has signaled that um, her blood sugar is off, and um, that each of those visits it's something like six thousand the times that the dog had indicated and each of those may have resulted in a hospital visit. So dogs have a sense of us, even when we don't have a sense of ourselves. And that is really, really interesting. And they, they smell it, they sense it. We saw that picture of their nose um, that they really do think with their noses and they're, they're all in and they understand us on a level that possibly we might not understand them. And that's the point that I wanted you to take away from the, um, from the, from the, from the video. There's even some discussion now in the, the current pandemic situation about if dogs can sniff out COVID. And in Helsinki airport, there's a trial running that they say is going very well, that dogs are able to smell out COVID-19. So much like the realm of kind of um, bomb sniffer dogs, um, could dogs save us from the pandemic is the answer just to have people train up dogs and have them in schools, in airports, in universities, in hospitals as a way to identify people who, um, who, have, um, who have COVID-19 and are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, that critical period when symptoms are being um, that the person isn't showing symptoms but is spreading um, COVID-19. Um, COVID so it might be that dogs could actually save us from the, um, from the situation that we find ourselves in, um, in now. So I'd like to work through for the, for the next section of the, of the talk, what I'd like to work through are some examples of how dogs can be helpful. So just to give you a recap, to link together this story for you, what we started with was this really specific idea of kind of what emotions are and what does stress look like in the brain and what brain structures are important for things like stress and emotion and well-being and what areas of the brain, and I did that really, really quickly, too quickly, that's the sort of thing you spend a whole module on at uni, but we just did a whistle stop tour tonight. So now that we know a little bit about what we're looking for in the brain and how even because what I would like you to take away is that even on the neuronal level, on the, on the cellular level in the brain, stress, depression, different sorts of emotional issues and mental health problems might be impacted by, um, by the environment around us. So what I'd like to do now is talk about um, an example that used dogs specifically, moving on from the possible um, neurobiological mechanisms underlying these, but to actually talk about some dogs. And I found three papers that have been released in 2020. So brand new papers, that was my selection criteria is that they were brand new papers that looked specifically at, um, at behavior with dogs. And what I looked, I found a paper that looked at anxiety with students. And what this paper did was they had a between subjects design where participants were assigned into one of three conditions. They either had 30 minutes with a qualified professional at the student well-being counseling service. They had 30 minutes with a certified therapy dog, such as, such as Penny, or 30 minutes of a pre-recorded guided mindfulness exercise. And the research question that they were exploring was, can interacting with a dog reduce anxiety in students? 
So here's the results, and I'll talk you through these. Um, I'll talk you through these findings. We have our three groups: the control group, which was talking to a traditional therapist, the dog therapy um, condition where people had played with the certified therapy dog for 30 minutes, or the mindfulness session. And they they explored anxiety levels over two time points. So before the treatment and after the treatment. And if we look at these, the, the blue bars, you can see that the blue bars are higher at time point one for all of the groups and lower at time point two for all of the groups. So all of the treatments worked. There was a reduction in anxiety in regardless of whether the student saw a therapist, played with the dog for 30 minutes or had the mindfulness session but the difference was greater with the dog and with the students who were given the mindfulness treatment. Really importantly, if we look at standard anxiety levels for this scale, you would expect a normal, you know, a typical rating for anxiety, someone where you'd say that's a well person, that's not someone who's particularly anxious at this time, would be about 31 to 34 as a score. And if we look at this graph and we look at the green bars, you can see that in the time point two, so after the treatment for the people in the dog condition and the people in the mindfulness condition, they have normal scores. The people that saw the therapist have a reduction in their anxiety, but they are still what we would call highly anxious. They are still rating very high on this scale. So dogs are brilliant. The other factor that they looked at in this study in emotional well being in terms of anxiety, so anxiety scores was the dependent measure in this, in this study, was a mood rating. And after seeing the therapist, the mood, the mood of the participants was not significantly different from what it had been before they'd seen the therapist, but the mood, their direct immediately after their mood was significantly improved after playing with the dog, after having a 30 minute session with the dog. The difference from mindfulness was not significantly different. That, that increase that you see is there, but is not, a significant, is not a significant difference. For the dog group, however, it was. So there was a significant reduction in anxiety and a significant improvement in, in mood. Now, this was a single session. This doesn't discount the role of therapists. What this is showing us is that in the holistic environment of a person who may be suffering from something that is a mental illness that is receiving clinical treatment right down to just everyday managing of emotions, that there are things that we can do in our environment that can help improve our mood or our state um, our state anxiety. A second example that I'd like to give you, and this is quite a dense, a dense graph, but this is a 2020 paper that came from Japan, which I thought was interesting because it shows potential cross-cultural um, effects. And what they looked at was physical well-being in terms of exercise. So there had been lots of studies that looked at self-report of people that have dogs who said they were more active. People who were more active, um, people said that they were more active if they had a dog. But what was interesting about this study is that they put accelerometers onto people and measured the amount of time a day that they exercised or were sedentary to really quantify these behaviors to determine if it's true if people really are more active if they have dogs and if getting a dog does make someone more likely to exercise. Now they used a middle age sample in this, um, in, in this study 
Um, so it was a middle-aged to older, um, older sample of participants. And they looked at people who owned dogs and people who didn't own dogs. You can see the sample size there, 119 dog owners and 574 non-dog owners. And they, and they measured the total time that they were, that they um, were sedentary or sitting. Um, sitting is um, um, related to a lot of negative health outcomes. And then they looked at um, how long people sat for, how many bouts of time they sat for without moving, and then their physical activity. And whether their physical activity was light, moderate, or vigorous. And what they found in this sample is that it was quite a complex picture that people did move more. People were less sedentary if they had a, if they had a dog. But interestingly, only for light or physical activity was the difference found. Those individuals who engaged in moderate or vigorous activity, there wasn't a significant relationship to having a dog. But if, if an individual only engaged in light physical activity, then having a dog made them more likely to move. So the way in which one could interpret these results is to say that if you're really fit and you exercise a lot and you're, you lead a very active lifestyle, having a dog might not have make that much of a difference. However, for those who don't exercise as much and only engage in very light exercise, then they do spend less time being sedentary and move more. And having a dog does have a positive influence on, on exercise behavior, which is one of the positive outcomes of having a dog that's reported in the media. The third example that I want to give you from the research, I've tried to give you a sampling of different sorts of research styles that we explore in psychology. So we've looked at a between subjects design where participants were given different types of treatments in a laboratory setting. We have a field study where people wore accelerometers and just carried on their normal lives. And now we have a qualitative study where interviews were conducted where people were asked questions about their relationship with their pet. Now, I have to say, not, I love dogs, but they did include cats in this study as well. So cats are included in this, but having a pet and trying to understand this, this very question that we're asking here, what is it about having a pet that makes people happier? People who have pets, are happier. So what is it about that that makes that gives these these positive outcomes? And again, this is a this is a study that was just released in 2020. It's a new study. And the main themes that arose from the phenomenological analysis was that pets provide comfort and safety. There's a sense of social inclusion and participation in having a pet, a purposeful routine and structure to the day and having a meaningful role in life. Those were the main themes that arose in terms of why pets can be, um, might be, might be helpful. So at Newcastle, um, being a, um, a leader in so many um, things, dogs are a part of the wellbeing initiatives at Newcastle and is indeed the reason my participation in that is the reason that I'm um, that I was invited to speak to you tonight. And the university has a dog called Bessie. And um, Bessie's not available for walks right now, um, but I'm sure she will be when um, when things when things return to um, when things return to normal. But the university, as part of its package in taking care of an entire person and all of the things that come and with a person and make them the complex creatures that, that we are. Dogs are an important part of that. In the School of Psychology, um, we have two um, 
well-being dogs as part of the Dogs for Welfare program. And these two dogs, um, Sammy is a Border Terrier and represents one of the best trained dogs I have ever seen. She does agility. She is just the most incredibly trained, professional, amazing dog. And Penny, Penny's beautiful and he has that going for him. Penny is not well-trained at all, and they represent opposite ends of the spectrum in that, um, in that way. And they come into uni on different days of the week, and um, they're just available to, for people who, um, we get a lot of students who come and visit who are missing dogs at home coming to uni, they're suddenly separated from their, from their family pets. And having a dog that they can interact with can just give them a feeling of, um, give them, give them a feeling of, of home. So that's one of the, the, the sorts of, um, of, of students that we get coming to visit us. Some just think, I think I'd like to pet a dog. I've never seen a dog before. I'd like to have a go. Um, is some of the students that that come um, that come to see us, but we get so many visitors and so much joy that comes just from seeing um, these two these two dogs in the in the school um, that we are very much looking forward to bringing the program back when. Um, when the pandemic eases and uh, social distancing isn't a, isn't a requirement any, anymore. So um, I was made fun of by my son for this slide and he told me that I should replace it, but I didn't. So I'm just going to apologize and present it to you as it is. But there are some negatives to, um, to having dogs around. We've talked a lot about the positives, but we, it wouldn't be right and it wouldn't be fair if we didn't talk about why the advice isn't just go get a dog and all your problems are over just go get a dog there are allergies um, an estimated 13 to 19 percent of people will have an allergy to dogs not all of those will be severe they'll be of different different levels but allergies are an issue for for some people that need to be considered um, fear people um People can be afraid of dogs. There can even be phobias of, of, of dogs. People can have negative experiences with dogs, even in childhood, that could cause them stress and distress on um, being in the presence of a dog. Some dogs are aggressive. Not all dogs are um, puppets, like the one sleeping, snoring beside me um, right now. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with having a dog that can cause stress in itself. Um, they need to be walked, they need to be taken care of. We'll come on to that, back to that in a minute. And there's also the cost associated with with having a having a dog. The Dogs Trust estimates that it costs between a thousand to two thousand pounds a year to keep a dog um, properly. On the benefits, there's companionship, exercise, the physiological and emotional benefits that we've talked about, um, that we've talked about so far. Um, in my um, career exploring issues of animal welfare, um, I feel it's particularly important, especially in um, the current climate where um, dogs are, the price of dogs is increasing exponentially as people are thinking, well, there's a lot of interesting things behind the dog phenomenon in COVID that so many people are going out to buy dogs. Maybe with being home, there's the possibility to, to have a dog and have the time to have that companionship. People are lonely and maybe they feel it's the right time to get a dog, which is excellent if it's the right thing for that family. And I just wanted to be, um, um, I think it would be remiss to not say that it needs to be a carefully considered decision as to whether one um, gets a dog or um, if one gets a dog or not and gets the, 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 right, the right dog. So I just wanted to advocate for responsible dog ownership. But what if you don't want to own a dog? 
Now, I don't know anything about this business and I'm not, um, I'm not speaking for them. I've just heard of them. I've just heard advertisements about them. Um, and this is one example of a way in which people that don't have the time for a dog or aren't in a place that they could, um, that they could have a dog can interact with the dog. Um, we have our university scheme as well at Newcastle, but there are these broader schemes that try to bring people together to get the positive aspects of, um, of, of dogs and give dogs what they want, which is really to, um, to love and to be, and to be part of a, uh, of a, of a family. And we finished a little early because I didn't get to show my video, but that gives more time for questions if anyone has any. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Barbara. And that was so interesting. Um, we've definitely had lots of questions come through. Um, so if you're happy, I'll just start asking you some. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We've had a lot of people who are quite concerned about any ethical implications of having a well-being dog or pet. And they're wondering if being around somebody who has anxiety or mental health issues whether or not that can sorry, be you've frozen on me. You've oh, frozen no. on me. Could you, sorry, I Lord, I, you, 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 I lost you there and I didn't hear you. I heard ethical considerations and that was um, it. So I'm sorry um, to interrupt, but no, if you could start. Absolutely over. fine, no problem. Um, basically, they're just wanting to know if there's any eth ethical implications and if it, an animal being around somebody with mental health issues such as anxiety, can that then have implications for the, the animal? It's a really, really important question. And in this paper, so the, 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 the protection of animals is very highly protected in the UK, especially in research settings. And the, you can find a lot of information on the NC3R's website. And that's everything from laboratory animals right up to the dogs that would have been used in this, um, in, um, in that study that I presented where the dogs were put in a room with people. So I didn't go through the methods. So very good at calling me out on it because what they did was they put the dog um, the dog was with their with their handler and they they introduced the dog to the person and made sure that the dog was happy with that um, with that and that the dog was okay and that the person was okay and then they watched through one-way glass so they left the dog and the person alone after they'd had an opportunity to interact with each other and watch through one way glass. So could it cause the dog distress? It's possible. And when to, for Penny to become a part of the university scheme, he was assessed by an expert in dog behavior which was quite intense. It took nearly an afternoon. Um, he went through loads and loads of different things to see if he could be provoked, to see how he responded, and to see how he responded in distress, because he was pushed to the point that he was unhappy and growled, and he was pushed you know, to that point to see how he would respond. And then importantly, I was being tested as well, because it was how I responded to his to his distress. So the ethical implications are that I think, and this is why I spoke about responsible pet ownership, because I don't think the answer is to just have dogs everywhere, because then the dogs will be neglected. And this has to be a loving relationship. This is a relationship, because I suspect this is what's underlying all of this, is the connection and the relationship. And that means the animals being well taken care of and well provided um, and, and well provided for. So Penny only comes in with me once a week on a good day. Sometimes I bring him in twice, but I will limit the number of people who see him and he loves attention. He absolutely loves it. He is on his back the, the entire time that he's there wanting his belly rubbed. But even still, I want to know that he's okay. So the university is really careful in and, and going through the process of being selected to bring a dog in is, is a very careful process to make sure that you have the right combination of people and a dog who's up for it is the, is the, is the thing. Brilliant, thank you. 
And um, a question here, what sort of career or jobs are there that involve research in the relationship of animal behavior on humans? Yeah, the behavioral neuroscience has so much there. These are the questions that we ask in the School of Psychology. They're, they're asked in the, um, in, in the wider um, range. There are MRES students, Masters of Research students that, that, study, um, that study these, these questions. There's so many different ways that you can ask. So I'm trying to think of just nailing down a few career options. So I'll give you an example. I was having a conversation with a colleague just the other day. He's new to the university and, um, and we had a conversation just about research and different ways that we might be able to come together on, on some projects. And what he studies is um, a specific type of neuronal dysfunction that occurs in autism spectrum disorder. So that's an example of how neuroscience explores a question. Now, what you can look at is ask what role do animals play in helping the outcomes of people with a particular sort of, sort of ailment. So you can do this at multiple levels. So the career options that could be open to you would really be, how do you see it? Do you see yourself being detached from the from the the research and that you're in a lab looking at those cells looking at the neuronal level trying to figure out the mechanisms underlying it and then applying it to someone who was say doing that qualitative study that I told you about where they're interviewing someone about their experience then there's people like me that are kind of in the middle <laughs> putting putting different pieces um, different pieces together Understanding behavioral psychology can take you a lot of places. People on our programs go on to do all sorts. They go on to do medicine, which is I know one of the things that you're, um, that you're here for today. They go and work in HR in different organizations to understand behavior. I spend a lot of my time working with police on understanding how behavior is related to emotional memory. So how we remember things in our, in our past. Before COVID, Penny was going to be involved in a study much like the one I described with a dog in a room, but with an awkward interview going on where people were asked about forensic negative experiences to see if they disclosed more information um, with the comfort of having a dog present. COVID ruined that along with so many other things, but hopefully that will happen again um, at some point in the, in, the, in the future. You're welcome to, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to saying that, seeing how many people are on the call, but if you think you're interested in behavioral psychology, you're always welcome to email me. Um, you can find me on the, on the Newcastle website and uh, I would be happy to talk through those, those career options if you think you'd like to come to Newcastle and study that sort of thing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, going back to the dogs again, yeah. uh, do they, does it need to be a specific breed to be able to, to do things like the sniffing out of the diseases or is it something that can be taught? So um, yeah, no, it seems to be a certain kind of, of, of breed. And I had a conversation with Durham Constabulary dog handlers at one, at, at one point, and they were saying that their preferred dog are, um, are Spaniels. And I looked down at Penny, I thought, Penny doesn't have what it takes and he's the wrong kind of spaniel but they they have spaniels they have labs they have golden retrievers it's finding the right dog you know for that because dogs are much like people they just have things that are easier for them you know we all have things that we're good at we all have things that are a challenge for us you know, and that's for every person. And part of the stage that if you're thinking about going to university, part of the stage that you need to think about is accepting what I'm really good at and what I'd like to do and what's going to be a really big challenge for me and finding that, um, finding that, finding that out. So I know that a lot of the dogs that are used for um, like 
hearing um, disabilities and sight disabilities are really commonly labs and golden retrievers are really, really commonly used. And also the size of the dog matters because the dog has to be able to direct the person um, around. But there's a lot more going into using other breeds and using mixed breeds in, um, in, in the field to explore um, what kinds of dogs can um, be better at, um, you know, at, at different sorts of jobs. Or um, um, Penny is a disabled dog, he's deaf. Um, and um, so Penny's, um, Penny's job is going to be to love people, for example. So that's his, and he's very good at it, so. So cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, a question here. Would you say that dogs understand us better than another human might? Um, he's just brought me his bear, actually. <laughs> I was going to grab him, but he ran away at me. That's a really good question. And I mean, that would be my first thought is how would we explore that in the lab? You know, what a great question to give um, to give to a to say a dissertation student to pick apart is and how would you tell? So that's why I went over all that neuroscience bit, which some of you might have thought boring. Some of you might have thought was OK, but, you know, what is it that's happening that makes an emotion? What is it that makes a memory? And then if we can connect, then what is that? So I think if I were to ask my son right now, he would say, absolutely, the dog knows him better than anyone else. He's absolutely his best friend. And he knows him better than anyone else in, in, the, in, in the world. Um, but I think that it would depend on the person because for someone who's afraid of dogs, that connection would be an absolute nightmare and would be a really, really negative and possibly even traumatic interaction. Um, do I think that personally, you know, um, colloquially from my, my and anthropomorphizing my experience of animal emotions onto humans? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I think that'd be a great question to um, to research in the in the lab if dogs can um, know and indicate um, what someone's um, what someone's emotions are. We found some future research as well. Yeah. Then <laughs> uh, going back to the study you were talking about about anxiety, mm. um, there's a question here asking how you measure levels of anxiety. Yeah, so the scale that they used is a standard anxiety scale. So it was a self-report scale where people asked various questions. So you're given a battery of questions in a questionnaire and people fill out a Likert scale, so one to five, and they're asked, so I feel my heart racing might be an item. And then they rate that one to five. So it's called a self-report scale and they're used quite a bit in clinical psychology. And those have been... Don't stop to knock my lamp over. One moment, please. <laughs> the reality of, uh, of doing things at home. <laughs> the bear that I didn't play with a moment ago that was brought to me, he just knocked my lamp over to get my attention. So, so answering the question about do dogs know what we're on about? Probably. <laughs> so, um, Sorry, what was this question was about? It was about the, um, how you measure anxiety. Yes, how you measure anxiety. So there's lots of different scales that are used. And something that we do in psychology is we have to ask about the validity of a scale. So it, how, what its specificity is and its validity. How good is it at measuring anxiety? So a whole separate set of studies would have been done that would have explored the scale that was used and determining along with the clinician. So that might have involved a separate study where they interviewed people about their anxiety and they were diagnosed by a GP and a clinical psychologist or maybe even a psychiatrist and then the questions were developed such that a questionnaire could be given that um, that an individual could fill out and give a score which isn't definitive because that's just their anxiety at that time at that time point but gives an idea of how they're of how they're feeling. Perfect. And um, coming back to students who would be doing exams, um, do you think if dogs were present before exams for students, it would reduce exam stress? Probably. Yeah, 
And I think there's a lot about, um, and because I'm a cognitive sort of person, I, I embed this in my teaching, my undergraduate teaching, but the idea of how important it is to take care of yourself. You know, the brain works better when you eat well and take care of your body and exercise and play with your dog or your cat or um, whatever it is that, that you like and play games and go out and have fun. Now, of course, you need to work hard to get into medicine. You know, you need to work hard. I work hard, um, but it's being kind to your body and being kind to your mind, sleep, getting you know, getting sleep is a massive factor in terms of, of doing well and consistently, you know, consistently um, getting a lot of sleep. But do I think filtering people through a puppy room on their way to their exams, it would just be, oh, I, I would worry though that people wouldn't go in. That's to exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> We'd never get it approved, would we? Because <laughs> everyone would just be there uh, playing with the dogs. Um, but do I do I think so? Yeah. Brilliant. I do. Thank you. And I think we'll probably make this our last question. Um, can you study psychology at university if you haven't studied it for A level? Yeah, I happen to be the admissions tutor for the School of Psychology. So I can definitively tell you, you don't have to take A level psychology. You're welcome to if you think you want to have a go at psychology, but we're going to teach you everything you're going to learn at A-level psychology, and we're going to teach you the way that we want to teach it to you. Um, there's no disadvantage to having taken A-level psychology, and if you need the confirmation that it's the right thing for you, then you should take it. What you do need is a science at A-level, and that can be psychology, or it can be something else but all of the admissions information is on um is on our websites so you're welcome to come to an open day or to speak to me um in my role as admissions tutor but no please go take other things like i said we'll teach you the psychology when you come to us mm -hmm.